Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss clonochiasis, caused by Clonorchis sinensis. Clonorchis sinensis has a very defined geographic distribution. It's found mostly throughout Southeast Asia, as you can see uh, in this map. There are some uh, endemic centers in the Korean Peninsula as well, but most of clonorchiasis uh, is acquired throughout Southeast Asia, particularly uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, that, that sort of uh, area, and Southern China. Its history of discovery involves James McConnell describing the adult worm isolated from a patient in all, in an, of all places, India, because I just told you that it's primarily in Southeast Asia, but South Asia has some infection as well. Arthur Loos actually described the parasite in detail and named it as well. Remember, Arthur Loos was also important in the discovery of hookworm disease. And finally, um, Haryujo, I hope that I've pronounced that correctly, Haryujo Kobayashi in 1910 identified the freshwater cyprinoid fish, which were uh, raised in uh, captivity in fish farms, as the primary source of infection. So the life cycle starts, as all of our other life cycles, with the ingestion of the stage or with the penetration of the skin of the stage. In other words, the mode of transmission of the parasite to the human host. You can see depicted here also there are some reservoir hosts. Both dogs and cats can serve as reservoir hosts, meaning that they too can harbor the adult stage of the parasite. So we begin by ingesting raw or undercooked freshwater fish. The stage of the infection that uh, is the source of the infection is called the metasaccharia. The metasaccharia lies just under the scales of the fish. And because raw fish is eaten along with rice and several other grains as well, uh, the fish is not examined very closely, but rather is minced usually and mixed with rice some sauces of various sorts, depends on the area in which the cuisines are being expressed locally. But nonetheless, most of the spices that are used to um, add flavor and um, color, perhaps even to the dishes as well, does not affect the invectivity of the metasaccharia, which is surrounded by a, a hard, impervious shell. When the fish is ingested, along with the metasaccharia, of course, the fish tissue is digested away in the stomach by the action of pepsin, and that dissolves that outer coating of the metasaccharia, and it releases an immature form of the parasite, which then travels into the small intestine until it encounters the secretions of bile, which, of course, occurs at the moment of ingestion of food. The small immature parasite then migrates into the bile duct and locates along the biliary tree where it attaches with an anterior and a ventral sucker. And that's where it grows up. It's hermaphroditic, which means that it contains both male and female organs. So it self-fertilizes, the eggs are produced, the eggs then pass out of the biliary tree into the small intestine and eventually exit into the environment where they must be deposited in human feces in the in a freshwater environment. Now, you can imagine a lot of uh, aquaculture that goes on in Southeast Asia. And so this is an infection that's primarily transmitted to large numbers of people through the actions of very small numbers of hosts that are involved in the raising of these fish for food. The snail then encounters the parasite uh, via the myricidium, which exits the egg the moment the egg enters fresh water. The myricidium then penetrates into the snail, undergoes a series of developmental stages to later on produce the swimming saccharial stage which then seeks out a fish host. It migrates underneath the scales. The tail drops off. The stage rounds up, secretes an impervious layer on the outside, and there it sits, waiting to be ingested by another host. And that's a simplified life cycle, basically, of a very 
complicated epidemiology. For illustration purposes, here's the way the actual stages of the infection look. Here's the myricidium inside the egg. Here's the snail host. Snail host gives rise to the saccharia. The saccharia then, as I mentioned, crawls underneath the scale. And here is the way it actually looks. These are the scales of the fish out over here. And this is the rounded up metasaccharia. And that's the infectious stage for humans and for dogs and cats as well. So what does clonorchiasis do to us? <clears throat> well, it lives in the bile duct. And it lives in a place where um, a lot of epithelial tissue is being produced. And this parasite feeds on epithelial tissue. Over a long period of time, the fact that there are large numbers of worms, and four of them are shown here in cross-section, the epithelial tissue on the bile duct is shown here. Notice how irregular the bile duct tissue actually is, the epithelial tissue, is actually a lot smoother than that in a normal bile duct. But this worm has a way of inducing hyperplasia to allow its food to actually grow in front of it, basically. So it, it induces a hyperplasia of the epithelium, then the parasites come along and eat that epithelium. Then they crawl back to another place along the bile duct, they induce more hyperplasia, the bile duct responds by growing more epithelial tissue, and in doing this, the host tissue is forced to undergo many, many, many more division cycles than it ordinarily would in a non-infected host. Now, we think that plays a role in what happens next because in long-term chronic infections with Clonorca sinensis, the epithelium can actually transform and create a condition in which uh, metastasis is possible. So a cholangiocarcinoma is the end result of infection under a long-term exposure to the secretions of the adult worms, which cause this hyperplasia to begin with. And here's a cross-section of tissue showing you what this hyperplasia looks like uh, when it's stained with uh, iron hematoxin and eosin. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. 36-year-old fisherman from the northeast part of Thailand presents with abdominal distension. He reports that he eats a normal diet of somtam and koi pla, raw fish pickled in lime juice and rice. He feels well, but has now noticed a yellowing of his skin and the whites of his eyes. He lives in a small village along the river in, northeast, in the northeast jungle of Thailand. He reports many dogs, animals in the area. And on exam, he is a thin, a febrile male with scleral icterus, that's a yellowing of the whites of the eyes. A large palpable non-tender mass is felt below an enlarged liver and his skin is jaundiced, turned yellow. So let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Now the symptoms are mostly determined by the inoculum of the metacercaria and then consequently the worm burden. Um, in acute infections with not a lot, so a few metasarcaria, patients are often uh, without symptoms. Um, while patients who have been infected with large numbers can actually present with right upper quadrant abdominal discomfort. So this is the upper right part of the belly um, with discomfort tenderness. They can have nausea, diarrhea, and headache. Um, when you have heavy chronic infections, you actually can get enlargement of the liver, hepatomegaly. Um, you can develop a chronic tenderness in that area, and you can um, also have an increase in the number of eosinophils, so eosinophilia. Now, heavy infections um, can actually um, also facilitate um, bacteria getting sort of blocked or sequestered in these areas. Um, you can end up developing areas where the biliary system is narrowed, again, having bacteria caused behind these. So you can end up with recurrent infections in these areas. So an ascending cholangitis, you can even end up with inflammation of the pancreas. Um, very heavy infections can lead to um, anorexia, cachexia, weight loss. Um, you actually see some laboratory abnormalities associated with these. So elevated alkaline phosphatase um, in the presence of normal um, liver transaminases. Think of those as a clue to think about. 
Um, and unfortunately, there's an associate with cholangiocarcinoma. So this is a um, bile duct cancer, bile duct carcinoma. And this is a longstanding sequelae that's due to the chronic fibrosis, the infection, and some uh, factors that we'll discuss. What about the diagnosis? Um, you want to wait about four weeks until the eggs start to be released into the feces. Um, you can then detect these under microscopy, but the sensitivity can be increased with um, nucleic acid amplification tests. These are both standard PCR as well as the isothermal lamp technique. Endoscopy. You can actually pass a scope, fiber optic scope, hooked to a camera or an eyepiece, and you can actually visualize um, in the biliary area um, doing what's called an ERCP or an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. You can actually visualize the, the flukes. Uh, serology is also available, um, and you can confirm this with a Western blot. We run out the proteins. Um, and then imaging. On imaging, you can um, actually see, you can get a visual of the presence of flukes in the biliary tract. Uh, and this could be ultrasound, CT, MRI, or you can actually inject dye in that area, so a cholangiography. This is just giving you a uh, visual of what the stools might look like when you see them. And these are just small um, eggs. Uh, what about treatment? Uh, now, there's going to be antiparasitics. There's going to be mechanical um, aspects to the treatment. So the antiparasitics, praziquantel, two days in general, but light, light infections, you may only need to treat for one day. Um, albendazole for a week is an option, as is mebendazole. But with mebendazole, you're going to have to treat for about 30 days. Um, so a lot of your options here are going to be based upon availability and um how many days you want to treat for. But mechanical interventions can actually come up because we can actually end up with obstruction, as I mentioned, these narrowings. So you may need surgery, you may need biliary drainage, and when a secondary bacterial infection has developed because of this um, parasite, we may actually need antibiotics to treat the uh, bacterial infection. The drug of choice, um, as I mentioned, this is nice because it's going to be a one or two day approach, is going to be praziquantel, and this is going to interfere with the calcium ion channels. What about our patient? Now, our patient, um, the Opus Thorcus viverini eggs were detected in the stool. He was treated with the praziquantel, um, three doses per day for two days. This was taken with liquids and uh, during meals, and the patient did quite well. Now, preventing and controlling this infection not only involves uh, human waste disposal that's done in a sanitary fashion, of course. You can see here a treatment plant and over here the, the classical outhouse. But we've got other animals to consider now, too, and those are much more difficult to control because they will defecate and urinate indiscriminately throughout the environment, and particularly the pets of owners of aquacultural systems uh, they are fed a portion of whatever they're farming. And as a result, the cats uh, don't often cook their meals before they eat them. In fact, they never do. Uh, they uh, acquire lots of this infection, as well as dogs. Uh, here's one being uh, fed by one of their uh, owners, a little kid that obviously is quite fond of the dog. And, and the dog can acquire the infection simply by uh, being exposed again and again to the uh, raw or undercooked fish products that are produced right over here in the lake that you see behind her. So that's a very difficult aspect to uh, deal with. In addition to that, dried fish products, which are exported to other parts of the world, some of them are not as dry as you would like them to be. When they dry, they die. But some of them are packed in um, vacuum-sealed containers in which the, the fish tissue is still viable. As a result, the metasecaria will survive and infections outside the sphere of its endemic centers throughout Southeast Asia and China have been recorded as a result. If you want to learn more about the carcinoma portion of the infection, there's an excellent recent review uh, that was produced this year. Um, and uh, we've talked about this on TWIP as well. Uh, you can access TWIP at microbe.tv slash TWIP. The next time we meet, we'll be discussing fasciola hepatica. Thanks for listening.